groups and initiatives were established. And um, one of these was uh, focused on seabed mapping and uh, another was on deep sea exploration. And so this formed the, what we call the AOR Atlantic Seabed Mapping International Working Group and the Atlantic Seafloor Partnership for Integrated Research and Exploration or ASPIRE. And that's all I'm gonna call it from now on, it's a mouthful. Um, the effort of the Seabed Mapping Working Group and ASPIRE initiative have worked closely also with the Galway linked Horizon 2020 projects that were launched shortly uh, after the uh, Galway statement was signed. Uh, some of these are notably I Atlantic, which had a very successful work on deep sea exploration and mapping in, in the, primarily in the North Atlantic, Mission Atlantic and Atlantico, uh, or I should say Atlas. And then of course now I Atlantic, Mission Atlantic and Atlantico are these new Horizon 2020 projects that are linked to the all Atlantic effort. And we're hoping to be able to leverage and collaborate with those initiative, those Horizon 2020 projects as well as we move forward and engage the South Atlantic. Um, we also, as an all Atlantic community, have a great opportunity to increase our efforts to support the goals of the Nippon Foundation Jepco Seabed 2030 project in the Atlantic. Yes, this is a global initiative to map the world's oceans aspirationally by 2030. That means do the new mapping and that also means gathering the data that it already exists and making sure it's, it's available to the public. Um, but we can focus on what we can get done in the Atlantic. And uh, we're, we're pleased today that we have um, uh, Vicki Farini here to help uh, with a discussion session, uh, who's, who's uh, the uh, lead for the, um, the Atlantic and Indian Ocean Regional uh, Center for, this, for Seabed 2030. So, um, We hope to provide a summary of the current state of seabed mapping and exploration in this side event and in these presentations, trace the progress of lessons learned from our existing efforts and explore opportunities for de developing these new collaborations and accelerate progress towards our common goals in the Atlantic. So without any delay, I'd like to get started with our first presenter. Uh, this is Dr. Tommy Fury from the Marine Institute of Ireland, and Dr. Fury is, is a dedicated member of the Atlantic Seabed Mapping International Working Group uh, since its inception. So, Dr. Fury, the floor is yours. Thank you, Terry. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully that's appeared. Um, and bear with me one more second. Okay, so I'm just going to basically, uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to, to, to uh, present here today on behalf of the Atlantic Seabed Mapping International Working Group. Um, we are a group of individuals, mostly in government bodies and, and uh, state agencies involved in uh, seabed mapping endeavors of various shapes and sizes. Uh, and we're, we're effectively trying to line up the, 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 uh, the collective effort and, and infrastructure to, to map the Atlantic. So uh, I have, let's say, three different hats on. Uh, I'm based in Ireland in the Marine Institute. Um, I work on our National Seabed Mapping Program, Inframar, with our partners, Geological Survey of Ireland, and it's funded by our Department of Communications, uh, Climate Action and Environment. Uh, secondly, I, I'm the Seabed Map and Work Package co-lead on the Horizon 2020 Mission Atlantic project. Uh, Kerry Howell, who's on this panel uh, and will um, speak later a little bit, uh, is, is very much involved in the Benthic side of that. Uh, and I'll, I'll outline a little bit of what we're trying to do there in due course. And the third hat, if you want, is the EU co-chair of the Atlantic Seabed Mapping International Working Group. Uh, so just to kind of give you a potted history of, of why we're here today and where, where this sort of started, from my point of view, obviously in Ireland we've been mapping our offshore since 1999. I've been involved since uh, 2000 uh, and we aim to finish our economic exclusive zone in 2026. And we have a fairly large footprint globally when you look at the, at the map of the planet in terms of our marine EEZ. This uh, is the signing of the Galway Statement, which took place in 2013, about 20 metres from where my office is based in Marine Institute in Galway. Uh, this followed shortly afterwards in December 2014. We had a workshop 
uh, which we supported and helped coordinate for seabed mapping uh, in Dublin Castle uh, under the Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance, uh, which followed, as, ter as, as Terry mentioned, the setup of this, uh, this working group uh, in Brussels in February 2015. Uh, and we shortly after, in July 2015, had a second meeting. Um, and uh, I guess being a group that preferred to do things and talk, we actually got out there within uh, five weeks. We were on a ship crossing the Atlantic, acquiring multi-beam data uh, on an opportunistic transect. Um, our Celtic explorer was heading to St. John's uh, in, uh, in Newfoundland uh, for Memorial University. And we basically put representatives from each uh, region on the ship and acquired a multi-beam transect. Uh, we did several more later uh, with various vessels involved through, through the partnership. And we did a, a remote uh, acquisition in 2017, which is the first one we had done in that, in that way, uh, acquiring the data from shore. Um, I was fortunate to be at an event in uh, 2016, in June, in Monaco, hosted by JEBCO, uh, the Nippon Foundation, and, and the IHO and IOC, and uh, I co-moderated uh, a panel on the use of bathymetry uh, in the context of the coastal perspective. Um, subsequently, uh, that led in June 2017 to the publication of the Roadmap for Future Ocean Floor Mapping, uh, and the setup of Seabed 2030 followed shortly afterwards. Uh, in the context of um, the benthic aspect of seabed mapping, we had a workshop under the AORA Coordinate and Support Action in IMR uh, in Norway, uh, and uh, that was where my involvement in Mission Atlantic began as well. Um, we published at the end of the uh, Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance Coordinate and Support Action, which Marine Institute led, um, a, a group, subgroup of the working group, the mapping group um, published a small roadmap document. Uh, and I'll just touch on that uh, in the next slide to show you a couple of the highlights of, of the outputs from the, the various meetings we had, about 11 meetings between 2015 and 2020. Uh, the link to, to this will be embedded in the PowerPoint that will be available. And equally, you can just Google Atlantic Roadmap Aora and you can pull down this little brochure. It has the details of who was involved, what organizations, individuals, et cetera, and what we were trying to do and the context of the Atlantic mapping endeavor. Uh, we, spent a lot, we spent lots of time during these meetings discussing the why, uh, the why of seabed mapping and the value of it. Um, we had various focus areas, uh, leveraging existing knowledge exploration, infrastructure, technology, and, and, and operational programs, trying to actively engage in mapping the Atlantic, uh, taking advantage of vessels that would not otherwise have been undertaking seabed survey work, uh, and promoting multidisciplinary surveys. So we appreciate fully that this is not just hydrography, not just water depth, it's, it's, it's an ecosystem which is complex and we need to, to engage with multidisciplinary scientists to, to map this. Uh, and to tell the story, to communicate with people, which is part of what we're doing here today. Uh, we split the Atlantic up into 400 by 400 kilometer boxes and the concept sort of originated from a discussion we had around how we approached the Irish mapping program where we set up inframar survey units. Each one was an estimated survey leg or the, based on the duration of a vessel uh, operational at sea. Uh, thankfully, the Atlantic is deeper and you can cover a larger area in a period of time. So, so the boxes were bigger. Um, but that, that sort of is a, a cartoon of, of, of the areas that are outside of the exclusive economic zones um, in effectively the high seas. In terms of outcomes, uh, we mapped uh, at the last count uh, last year over 1 million square kilometers of previously unmapped uh, seabed territory. Uh, we had very, very strong industry engagement from part, particularly from the midway through the sort of process from 2017, 2018 onwards. Uh, Fugro came on board uh, very significantly uh, and, and actively started to work with their clients to provide data into Seabed 2030 and into the Atlantic data centers. Uh, we had a lot of publications and uh, scientific literature has been generated um, on, on foot of the partnership and the, and the research activity that the, 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 the group were doing. Uh, most recently in the context of the Frontiers in Marine Science, uh, Luis Somoza from Spain published uh, on their, their survey in the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, and there's been a very significant amount of capacity build in what we've been doing. We've endeavored to bring early career scientists on board the vessels, 
give people the opportunity to network and, and, and to build out uh, on the partnerships that, that exist between the, the organizations involved. Uh, one of the key things obviously is, is that's come out of the, um, and, and the reason we pushed the brochure out was just to really put a call to action out um, where we want people to, and we're asking people to resource and deploy existing infrastructure to map, uh, to align priorities and standards and effort to, towards full coverage seabed mapping um, and to strengthen capacity build uh, and training opportunities, uh, collaboration research and dedicated mapping activities uh, and to share the data and the knowledge derived. Uh, there's very, very little point in doing this if we don't make it open access afterwards. And really a lot of this will be facilitated through new innovation and technology use and deployment. So some of the key messages, just as a sort of a take home, the Atlantic seabed is not mapped. People think it is. Um, uh, the number is incrementing slowly, but we're about at 20% at this stage, uh, indicatively. Um, Atlantic seabed bathymetry and benthic mapping data are the scientific foundation for future ocean governance. And I say that in the context of, you know, the seabed shape influences the actual dynamics of the oceans. Um, and in the context of benthic habitat, it's impacted by environmental conditions, whether it's depth, pressure, ocean chemistry, uh, currents, uh, and the habitat will change uh, and therefore is an indicator of change. So if we want to monitor over time the impact of climate change, um, we need to do more research in this space. The Atlantic map mapping community is small, uh, but it's effective, easily mobilized, very collaborative and moving towards a shared vision. Uh, and that's been, that's been proven in the context of what we've achieved as a group without a real program or project or budget allocation. We're just leveraging activities in various projects and programs uh, to, to get the work done and to try and develop a cohesive approach to this. Uh, we have a framework through the Mapping Working Group and the Aspire Initiative, which uh, you'll hear more about shortly, um, uh, which we can adapt uh, and we can ex extend this into the Southern Atlantic and we can widen the scope uh, as we go to try and bring in more uh, broad scale scientific uh, interest and involvement. But both initiatives are, are based around the fundamentals of partnership, sharing knowledge and data and engaging science, society and policy. So it's not science for fun, it's science for betterment of society. Strategic guidance and planning, the approaches we've developed will help towards uh, a strategic approach to, to operational deployment uh, and leveraging assets and improving efficiency of what we do collectively, uh, trying to get more out of the investment effectively to support initiatives uh, like Seabed 2030, which is Seabed depth, bathymetry focused. Um, and uh, we're, we're looking at, I guess, trying to inspire the world to map its world's ocean by 2030. Uh, Vicky can uh, touch to this again when she's uh, uh, leading the panel discussion. She's heavily involved in this initiative. Um, and really this data will inform policy, uh, promote sustainable use of our oceans and support scientific research. Uh, it's supported by the Nippon Foundation and JEBCO, uh, underpinned by IHO and IOC. The CBA 2030 uh, global call to action is kind of based around three pillars, really. Uh, um, it is about acquiring new data and sharing data and developing the workflows and infrastructure. And Jennifer will touch on this a little bit later as well uh, in the context of the uh, Digital Bathymetric Data Center. Uh, Technology innovation, we have to be clever in how we deploy and develop technology to support this globally, um, but also in the Atlantic um, and collaboratively. Uh, we need to do this together. It's too big a challenge to try and do this uh, as a single entity organization or, or, or individual. So some of the $20 million questions that people might have who, who maybe aren't familiar with, with what we're doing, um, uh, how much of this is going to uh, sorry, what do we mean, sorry, by seabed mapping in the first instance? Uh, and, and really, we're looking at mapping in the context of a systematic approach, uh, not piecemeal bits and pieces of data acquired by different equipment with different standards. We're trying to develop an approach to systematically map uh, the bathymetry and benthic habitat of the Atlantic. Um, who needs it and why? 
We all do. Uh, it's fundamental science. If you do not have a map, you cannot make a plan and you cannot manage your marine resources. Uh, you wouldn't do it on land, so why should we do it in the sea? Who should do it and where should we start? Um, industry, government, academia and society need to engage in this process uh, and we have started, as I mentioned already, we've mapped a million square kilometres of seabed that would, would not necessarily have happened had, had this process not begun. Um, why should I collaborate or share my data? As a scientist, you work hard to go out and gather your information, but it's little value uh, in the lifespan it will take to, 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 to better understand our oceans. Uh, a three-year research project, uh, if the data are not shared, will reside on, on, a, on a shelf somewhere um, of little value to anybody thereafter. So it's important that we all adopt an open uh, and accessible data approach to this. And power, there is power in partnership. Um, how much will it cost? Who pays and how? Um, that's, the, that's the big question, of course. Uh, and we are not at a point where we can answer that specifically yet. Uh, the benthic effort has not been defined. We've done a lot of work in trying to assess the level of work to, to map the bathymetry. Um, how long will it take? Uh, again, we've broken this down into effort days. This is just uh, received last night from Andy Armstrong and NOAA and uh, the Centre for Coastal and Ocean Mapping in New Hampshire. Uh, and just that red box in the southern Atlantic, this is an extension south of what I think Jennifer might show that where we started this process in the northern Atlantic later. Um, but this is the southern extent and just that one box, uh, if you look at the effort in each little 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 box they're in, the 1608, 618 sorry, operational mapping days to acquire data in that, in that area. So that's a significant amount of work. You can't obviously work uh, all year round on one vessel, transits to and, and from shore, port calls, etc. and weather logistics uh, will, 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 will prevent you doing that. Um, just to move on in the context of Mission Atlantic, which I've directly been involved in, uh, I co-lead Work Package 4 on benth benthic mapping, and uh, our goal here is to generate new maps of seafloor characteristics in benthic communities and, uh, and VMEs to support integrated ecosystem assessment in case study areas uh, in the Atlantic and at a base, an Atlantic basin scale. Um, we want to develop a strategic mapping approach, uh, which I'll talk a little bit in a minute about. Uh, we want to say, further characterize the seafloor and the benthic communities. Uh, we want to look at environmental drivers uh, and pressures and their impact on spatial distribution of communities and VMEs uh, and model the spatial distribution based on future predicted climate change scenarios. So it's much wider than just the bathymetry, but the bathymetry is a foundation layer that we need to be able to do this modeling work. Uh, this is a little bit of a graphic, just sort of looking at what this framework might involve. We need to look at survey priorities, which areas are more important for what reason, how do we acquire this, uh, what infrastructure can we use and deploy, how do we get access to it, how do we resource and fund the operational activities, um, uh, how do we access uh, um, the, the information, uh, in terms of missions and, uh, and initiatives, how do we link in this endeavor with, with the political uh, activity and, and uh, initiatives that are happening in the background? Uh, we're, we're at the start of the UN Ocean Decade uh, at the moment, and we are contributing data, significant data to that. Uh, in terms of socioeconomics, we really have to look at the, the cost, benefit, and the value of doing this work. Um, we have to look at the societal impact and communicate this to people. Data have to be uh, shared, the process of how you access it. Is it controlled? Is it restricted? All has to be built into a framework on how we, how we do this at a basin scale level. And how do we engage society in this and communicate the value and importance of doing it? What partnerships do we need to have in the room at the table to sign off on what would be an overarching framework? What is the capacity build required? How many people do we need do we need people ashore in remote stations driving on autonomous vehicles? Um, where are the hydrographic and benthic uh, graduates going to come from to support such a scale up of, of, of operational activity? Um, the research and innovation process around this, how do you make the data accessible, streamline it and speed up the access to it uh, and so forth. Connectivity is a key central issue and that's what we're really kind of, the reason we're here today is to look at the, the the joining up of programs, initiatives, uh, organizations, and, not, and sharing of knowledge to, to make this happen. 
Um, in terms of what's next, last slide, um, we are looking at obviously trying to build out this initiative, uh, this mapping endeavor and the support for it uh, into the Southern Atlantic across projects. Virla is here today for my Atlantic. I'm representing Mission Atlantic. Kerry's involved in that project and One Ocean Hub and various other endeavors, uh, which are multidisciplinary and, and involve lots of different aspects of marine science and exploration. Um, collate Atlantic mapping initiatives and activities and priorities. We really all need to know where each other are going, when and what we plan to do there uh, so that we don't end up wasting effort or, or doubling up on, 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 um, on mapping uh, and, and, and wasting time, uh, taxpayers' money, for want of a better phrase. Um, identify and expand Atlantic survey operational stakeholders and mapping. So we really have to make sure that we have all of the key people at the table in terms of developing this framework um, so that there's an agreement on how data are acquired, where the priori priorities are, and how that data feeds into support policy and management plans. Uh, we want to collate published guidelines and SOPs and take best practices that are already in place. There's no point in trying to rewrite the, 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 uh, the Bible on this. Um, we have a lot of work done by different organizations, so, so we need to collate this and, and there will be work needed to, be, to, to, to develop some of this and standardize approaches. Uh, we want to capture Atlantic mapping data flows uh, and workflows. Uh, so that we can visualize where data, where data goes so that new players that come in and come on board this initiative have a very clear, concise idea on how they can contribute and where their information needs to go. Uh, we will look to assess the funding models and opportunities to drive the Atlantic mapping agenda. Uh, so it's, it's a difficult challenge to, to map in areas that are not owned by your state because the resourcing for that um, typically will go to mapping within an EEZ. So this is, a, this is something we really have to delve into. Uh, and as a community, we really want to continue acknowledging the collective effort and ambition of the Atlantic mapping uh, activists and, and supporters. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, and hand you back to Terry. Well, thank you, Tommy. That was a incredibly comprehensive um, presentation. I think you did a good job of really providing background on the history of the uh, of the seabed mapping effort under the Galway statement, uh, some of the achievements, uh, some of the key achievements, as well as the, the real key and importance of collaboration in moving us forward. I also think you did a great job of really highlighting how we can now move into the all Atlantic context, try to bring in other partners and leverage opportunity also showing that we don't need to necessarily have a nice big pot of money to reach into, although that's nice, um, but we can leverage efforts across the, across the Atlantic. Also supporting Seabed 2030, an incredibly important initiative to, to, to get the seabed mapping done. And uh, I think finally just showing the need for seabed mapping and, and the, uh, the status of where we are, that we have a long way still to go. So thank you for that. I think I will Given uh, the time, I will think open up for one question uh, and then we'll move and then other questions can be typed into the Q&A text box and we will get to those hopefully maybe in discussion or we can answer them later, but I will take one. So I'm going to turn to Monica. So please do put it in the text box if you have a question. So Monica, do we have any? Not at the moment, but if anyone has a question, please feel free to type it in, in the Q&A section. Yeah, I'll wait, wait a got 10 seconds or so and see if anybody's got a question. Okay. All right. Well, if there are no questions, then we will we will move on um, to our next presentation. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Casey Cantwell, who is the Expl Explorations Operations Chief at NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research. Um, uh, sh she will provide us with a presentation on the Aspire Initiative, Ocean Exploration Activities and, and Opportunities to Move Forward. And so, Casey, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, let me just, if you guys can just confirm for me when you can actually see my screen.
We can see your screen. Great, thanks. Uh, so thank you guys very much for inviting us to chat today. Um, NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration Research or NOAA Ocean Exploration uh, has been spending a lot of time exploring the Atlantic lately and we're so excited to share with you what we've been doing um, and to be a part of this event which highlights a lot of the work our partners have been doing as well. So for a lot of people there are different definitions when we sit, talk about ocean exploration. Um, people may think about it as some of the more traditional ocean research or they may really think about it as you know going somewhere and figuring out what's there. For us Deep ocean exploration is inclusive of water column, seafloor, subseafloor mapping, um, as well as the acquisition of samples and sensor-based data that can provide the initial observations of an area's physical, chemical, geological, biological, and marine cultural heritage features. So for us, we are guided by a series of principles of exploration. And our principles of exploration are really what underpins how we do deep sea exploration. So we work very closely with the science and resource management community to assess the data gaps and determine where exploration data is needed. We then conduct our expeditions and our grants projects and our partnership projects in a way that we can address those exploration priorities. With all of our investments, we strive to collect data that is useful and high quality and that can be used both by current researchers today as well as those for generations to come. When planning our operations, we do our best to systematically build a um, continuous bathymetric coverage everywhere that we go um, and to expand the spatial footprint of new data in areas that have never been explored before. With our website and social media channels, sometimes even live video feeds, we share discoveries with the public in real time or near real time. And a critical part of our exploration is making sure that all the data that we collect is documented with appropriate metadata and then is archived in a publicly available area that people can access it in a timely manner. So to execute these principles of exploration, we conduct regional campaigns to reveal the unknown deep sea. Um, we define a campaign as um, a series of expeditions that are paired together um, in a way that is multi-partner, multi-year, multi-platform, and it's an undertaking that is set to meet specific objectives that are set and defined by partnerships. Um, campaigns are composed of a series of these expeditions that then build coverage in an area and then end up having these uniting exploration priorities that collectively build upon each other's scope of work. These expeditions use a variety of technology and platforms to um, continue to expand the footprint of exploration over time. And then we have robust engagement in education and outreach efforts that engage the public and again, continue to expand and highlight the breadth of work that we are doing. So this graphic illustrates some of the key elements that go into planning and executing a campaign. Early on in the planning phase of a campaign, partners, resource managers, and members of the academic industry and philanthropic communities are engaged to identify exploration priorities. While campaigns can vary in their scale, their size, their scope, and honestly, even in their formality a bit, one thing that is always true though that is there is a series of overarching objectives that are identified at this level and early on in the planning phases that are used to inform all the expedition and project plans to come. And then we have additional points of, of contact with these communities and from regional and local stakeholders that give them a chance to provide input into very targeted um, site exploration as well. At the conclusion of an expedition, then data is made publicly available and new discoveries then are going to feed into the planning cycle for the next evolution or the next stages of the campaign. So ASPIRE, um, or the Atlantic Seafloor Partnership for Integrated Research and Exploration, is a multi-year, multinational collaborative field campaign that is set to basically raise our collective knowledge of the North Atlantic. Uh, it's providing a foundation of publicly accessible baseline data to increase the understanding of this region. The effort's also providing critical information relevant to emerging blue economy sectors that include sustainable fisheries, offshore energy development, coastal and offshore hazards, as well as others. This effort is coordinated by NOAA, but it's very closely linked to our domestic partners as well as international partners and projects, many of which you can see here. Um, and as Terry mentioned, this project is endorsed by the Galway Statement Implementation Committee. 
So as I mentioned before, one of the key things that always is true about a campaign is that there's a series of uniting um, objectives or science priorities. For Aspire, this is what they are. Um, we want to improve the knowledge of unexplored areas within both the US waters as well as the high seas. We wanna characterize deep sea coral and sponge and chemosynthetic communities and water column habitats, enhance predictive capabilities for vulnerable marine habitats as well as submarine geohazards, expend bathymetric coverage in both US waters and international waters, particularly in support of Seabed 2030 and the National Strategy for Ocean Mapping, Exploring and Characterizing the US EEZ. And we want to increase the understanding of deep ecosystem connectivity across the Atlantic Basin. So to date, Aspire has included um, nine ships. We've executed 300 or 430 days at sea. Um, we have mapped over 300,020 uh, 300,000 square kilometers and conducted 143 vehicle dives. So ROV and HOV um, and AUV dives. And you can see here the number of projects that are currently um, part of the Aspire expedition. So one thing that's worth noting here though, is that while much of Aspire has been focused on um, domestic US waters, there's also been a significant international collaboration and investment in the high seas. We've structured key expeditions um, or sort of field efforts that are, um, meant to engage our international partners, as well as to work in um, both international, um, in Canadian and Portuguese waters, as well as in the high seas. Um, and then while we've been doing all of our work domestically, we've been ensuring that all of the data and samples that we've collected will feed into greater um, international efforts. So this is a really good model though for, um, other nations that are looking to develop their um, domestic exploration efforts, but also still contribute to international efforts. So one of the benefits of a, taking a campaign approach is that the mapping and exploration that is done each build upon each other and that you have a, the ability to continue to grow and expand the footprint of exploration um, throughout time. So here you can see a series of um, mapping surveys that were done um, on the Blake Plateau. This is just offshore of Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina, and the U.S. Southeast Coast. Um, these surveys were conducted over a series of years by NOAA Ocean Exploration and some partners. And over time, we have built a continuous bathymetric service in this area, which has revealed one of the largest deep sea coral provinces um, that we have found to date. So, in terms of the why Aspire works, um, you could talk about for days about all the discoveries that have happened over um, this campaign since we started in 2016. But the key things that make it work are that we have unifying priorities and messaging, that we're able to leverage partnerships, and that so many people were willing to come on board and to work with us as we try to execute these partners, these projects. Um, we take advantage of complementary capabilities. So um, a lot of you may have worked with us through our work with NOAA Ocean Explorations, um, missions aboard Okeanos Explorer, or you may have worked with one of the other partnership projects that we have funded or supported throughout these projects, um, throughout this campaign as well. Um, the other thing that has been really successful is cross-pollinating of personnel. So we've been working directly with our partners to make sure that we are constantly talking to each other as well as sharing data, but then also making sure that we're actually physically interchanging personnel so that people get a chance to see um, in real time what's actually happening on board the different platforms. And you get a chance to really make sure that the, all the SOPs and the policies processes um, are sort of shared amongst partners. In terms of what's next um, for Aspire, uh, in just a few weeks here, we will be heading out to the high seas to explore the corner rise in New England seamounts. Um, that'll be June 30th to July 29. Um, this is one of our pledges that supports um, the All Atlantic Forum. Um, and this will be a telepresence enabled ROV and mapping expedition. So for those of you that are interested in participating, please do. Our expeditions on board the Okeanos Explorer are open to the community um, to participate. So we invite you to join us. And then in the fall, we'll do a little bit more work to close the gaps on the Blake Plateau, um, again, offshore Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Um, and this will be a series of three expeditions, two mapping to close the polygon gaps that are here, um, as well as an ROV and mapping expedition at the end of the fall in order to um, continue to expand our exploration footprint there. Again, 
these are definitely expeditions that are open to the community and we welcome active participation from all of you. And that is it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Casey. That was a very, another very comprehensive presentation. I think uh, you did an excellent job of really kind of showing what NOAA's ocean exploration program really is all about. Um, and the history of the Aspire initiative. And I, I especially liked, uh, and the accomplishments to date, which is impressive, but also why Aspire works. I think that's, that's a key message. Why does it work? How do we get bringing the, cl the collaboration together, getting the partners together? And there's no reason why we can't think of this as also finding ways to do this in, throughout the Atlantic, not just in the North Atlantic. So I really thank you for that. Um, Monica, you did mention that there were some questions. Uh, so if there's a question for, for Casey, um, could you go ahead and let us know? Yes, there is a question for Casey um, and I'll go ahead and read it. Um, this is from Alexandra. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, they say, thank you very much for pushing the ocean exploration forward and advocating for our ocean. This question is directed to all the panelists. During your expeditions, you gather plenty of data that may be useful to other researchers. Is it possible to access your institute data through Copernicus? Is there any equivalent American service available? What are the challenges that you face in integration of these data with our European system? Would it bring value to our researchers? So Monica, would you like me to start with that one? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so um, for NOAA's ocean exploration, um, what we do is we make our data publicly available through the NOAA archives. Um, so our data that we collect sort of by our own expeditions and our own operations are available typically 90 days or so after the expedition and they're public. Um, we view our role in the community here as really collecting data on behalf of everyone versus looking at it for one PI's project. Um, we do also sponsor a series of grants, which is much more traditional exploration research. Um, and those are usually about a year to two years or so delayed in releasing their data, but we do have a requirement that everything is made public. Um, the NOAA archives and our partners at the National Centers for Environmental Information are really wonderful people who are working to get those data into as many um, open source formats that can be pulled into other systems as possible. I know um, probably Jen uh, Jenks, who's on this call, can probably answer a few of those questions a little bit better than I can, um, but we do strive our best to make our data public and open source so others can pull it in. Thanks, Casey, and I'll, I'll follow up with that as well. So yes, um, I'm Jennifer Jenks. I'll be giving a presentation at the end of uh, today's events, but I, I do serve as the director of the IHO's Data Center for Digital Bathymetry, which is hosted by NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information, which Casey just uh, referred to. Um, and we are the archive for not only bathymetric data, but for all um, marine geophysical, oceanographic data, uh, climatic data as well. And so, yes, um, we do work very closely with NOAA's ocean exploration to make sure um, that their data does come into our archive that can be easily searchable and accessible um, and, and shared throughout the community. I, I do know that, you know, Casey might uh, drop a couple of these links in the chat window, but there are also some specific OE um, data viewers that just focus on all of the great work uh, that the OE program is doing. Um, but yes, and so again, it, in my presentation, I'll also share some, some URLs that can show the uh, ability to easily access and discover all of these data. Oh, thank you, Jen. Um, Monica, we do, we have uh, another question. Yes, we had a question um, regarding Tommy's presentation. And this was, um, from Agbu, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. And their question was, uh, indeed, it was a nice presentation. How was the current COVID-19 pandemic affected ongoing seabed mapping projects? Yeah, I, I guess uh, to varying degrees, uh, depending on which country you're in and which ship, which ship you look at. 
Um, we haven't really done a, let's say, an all Atlantic assessment of this. Um, but what I can tell you is that uh, nationally, we were very fortunate. Uh, in 2020, we managed to deliver our entire annual program uh, and meet the targets we had set. So the shipping community are, are pretty resilient. Um, the maritime community really locked down on the mitigation. Um, but I, I can I, I do know and I'm aware that the uh, the research program operations that were scheduled uh, were impacted. Uh, certainly, uh, the Eurofle Eurofleet's plus, plus program apologies uh, has had some surveys deferred, uh, and some of the Horizon 2020 projects I'm aware of have also had survey operations delayed. So that there has been an impact. I couldn't tell you the, the, the full extent or, deg or, or kind of um, degree of it at this point in time. Thankfully, we're at the point where this is, this is seem, we seem to be winding up and, and, and uh, our operations are becoming more, more uh, streamlined and, and more straightforward. Uh, that we still have very stringent mitigation in place in Ireland, and, and I expect that is the case uh, across Europe. And, and the Atlantic wide basin. Okay, well, thank you, Tommy. Um, I think we're going to uh, move into the panel discussion. Um, and if there are relevant questions, those can hopefully come up then. Please, uh, again, type those into the Q&A box. And if you have them directed to a particular person on the panel, uh, please so state. Um, I'd like now to uh, Turn the turn the uh, the floor over to Dr. Vicky Farini from Columbia University, who is the center head for the Seabed 2030 Atlantic and Indian Ocean Regional Center. So, Vicky, you have the floor for our panel discussion. Great, thank you, and uh, thank you to Tommy and Casey for the, those great talks uh, to kick us off. Uh, so, to start the panel, I just want to introduce the panelists. Um, we have Marcelo Esperle. We have Verle Huvene, we have Carrie Howell and David O'Sullivan. So I'm gonna have them introduce themselves and just give us a brief summary about what they do and how their projects relate to mapping and exploration in the Atlantic and perhaps in the South Atlantic specifically. Uh, I guess I should say who should go first. So I'll go with Marcelo first. <laughs> okay, Vicky, thank you so much. I'm very glad to be here representing Brazil. Uh, so I should say that the, the Brazilian Marine Geology and Geophysics Program that we call PGGM uh, was founded in 1969 and it nowadays integrates a network of over 27 Brazilian academic and scientific institutions. So far, this cover from north to south Brazil about 8,000 kilometers of coastline represented in the PGGM group. Uh, over the last 52 years, uh, the PGGM has actively contributed to the elaboration, education, uh, public policies uh, to increase the knowledge of the Brazilian and South Atlantic continental margin in its various aspects, scientific, academic, strategic, and national security, environmental management, and formation of undergraduate and graduate students. So since its foundation for more than 50 years ago, uh, we met annually to discuss and propose projects together uh, for the South Atlantic. Uh, these results, are widely published. And they also we define uh, the main Brazilian policies for the exploration of marine research in the South Atlantic. So uh, all of our activities are based on the geological and geophysical mapping of the seabed and involve mineral and environmental exploration projects. So we have a, a very wide network, scientific network uh, that we could help a lot uh, with thinking in mapping the South Atlantic. 
that's so. Great, thank you. Virle? Hello, good uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, wherever you are. Um, so I'm Virle Juvene, um, I'm a principal uh, researcher and team leader for CIPLOR on habitat mapping at the National Oceanography Center in Southampton. Um, and so in, in our institute, we have several uh, um, projects and, and programs on seafloor mapping, where we heavily rely and use um, the latest developments in robotic technology. So we, we contribute a lot towards the development of robotic technology to support our mapping work. We contribute also to, uh, as I said, the large programs like CVET 2030, Emot net bathymetry and so on, but today in the, in this panel maybe um, like like Tommy said I'm, I'm wearing several hats, but I'm mainly wearing the hat uh, of our contribution to the High Atlantic project. Um, so I'm I'm also leading the work package on on mapping in that project, and so again Tommy has um, already. Um, uh, refer to that. I Atlantic is one of the Horizon 2020 projects funded under the BLEM statement, so with, a, with an explicit remit to uh, extend our Atlantic research into the into the South Atlantic as well. And the aim of the project is to create an integrated assessment of the I Atlantic ecosystems in space and in time. But uh, I Atlantic therefore focuses specifically at the open ocean and, and the deep ocean, um, the benthic system. Um, the project has five objectives and you can read more about it in, in a PowerPoint that will be um, shared with, with the people in this webinar um, at the end of the webinar. Um, but one of the objectives is ocean mapping, uh, sea and habitat mapping. Uh, and in, in that context, we, we aim to work at three nested scales. So we, we have um, activities at the basin wide scale. We also focus on specific uh, key regions. And then we have uh, some of the most innovative uh, and the, um, new development work at very local scales. Um, so in terms of mapping, uh, we include collection of new data. Uh, we try to unearth uh, data sets that have been um, gathering dust on people's shelves for, for years and have not been accessible. Um, we also um, use that data towards uh, the development of habitat maps, um, species distribution models, predictions under future climate change. And as I said, it, uh, it also includes an uh, important uh, component of technological development. Great, thank you. Um, how about David? Hi, how are you doing, folks? Uh, my name is David O'Sullivan. I am Irish and I work here in Inframar in the Marine Institute. I work with Tommy Fury, who's just ever given the introductory speech there. Um, so I work with the value added program of Inframar and the development of seabed maps and how they're used within multiple marine sectors. Um, I'm a marine biologist by trade, so I would have interest in fisheries and habitats and how seabed maps can be used to delineate habitats. So there's obviously a lot of expertise in the group here. I'll leave the experts in the group talk about that. but. About ten, and I'm also here to talk as uh, an early career scientist. <clears throat> and about 10 years ago, when I was coming out of college, I realized that seabed maps could be used to, to study habitats much better than um, snorkeling around them. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about how I got from A to B to C and ended up on a transatlantic survey representing my continent to go into the Arctic Circle and have led a sea rover survey, which was a very comprehensive assessment of Ireland's marine biodiversity as a chief scientist or a study. Very much that should do it great thanks and finally last but not least carrie thanks vicky i'm carrie howell i'm a deep sea ecologist from plymouth university in the uk and i'm head of the um, deep sea conservation research unit and uh, the mapping work i'm involved with is really very much focused on producing maps uh, to support a marine spatial planning and spatial management of the marine environment so we spend a lot of time mapping the distribution of species and habitats uh, but bathymetry mapping is the basis of, of all of that. And so this, this work of mapping the Atlantic is extremely important. Um, we've been doing a lot of work in the South Atlantic of late as part of Mission Atlantic that Tommy's already introduced. Uh, so I won't cover that again. Um, but also uh, um, two other programs, uh, One Ocean Hub, and also the Blue Belt program, which are both UK funded. And, and that work's been focused um, particularly around the UK overseas territories of Ascension, St Helena and Tristan da Cunha in the South Atlantic. Um, but through the Mission Atlantic program and the One Ocean Hub, we're working with partners in Ghana, uh, Namibia, South Africa, Brazil, Uruguay and Argentina 
to try to produce uh, South Atlantic uh, comprehensive habitat maps, both at broad scales and very fine scales, um, using things, uh, as Verla mentioned, like species distribution modeling techniques. Um, and so, yeah, we're really uh, very uh, excited to be here and just cannot speak highly enough of the importance of bathymetry mapping, so thank you. <laughs> Great, and I guess I'll give just a little more context about myself. Um, as has been mentioned, I lead one of the regional centers for Seabed 2030 focused on the Atlantic, hence my involvement with this group, uh, but also the Indian Ocean. I'm also very deeply involved with data management and bathymetry and subsea floor data for the US academic community. So uh, my roots run deep in all of these kinds of data and bringing it together and making it interoperable and accessible. Um, okay, so what we're going to do for the next 20 minutes or so um, is maybe 25 if we're lucky, have a bit of a conversation about some of uh, some topics that maybe we can um, provide some success stories on, some lessons learned that can help inform uh, the scaling up of mapping efforts and collaboration really throughout the entire Atlantic Basin. Uh, so the first question, which will really be open to all panelists, and again, we really want this to be a conversation, is uh, what role can international research projects play in mapping the Atlantic? So anybody that wants to start, I'll just let it be free form. <laughs> And if nobody speaks, I will, but I'm sure you have things to say. I'm, I'm happy to take that on. Um, as I'm representing a, a large uh, international research project um, or several large international research projects, I would say in my, in my view, um, they can really be a driver for new collaborations across, across the Atlantic. Um, put a few scientists in a, in a room together and give them a, um, a subject to talk about and they'll become, <laughs> they'll, they'll very quickly start making connections and, and interact and, and that will grow into a, a stronger network later. So uh, again, uh, it has been mentioned in the presentations this morning before, uh, the precursor of the iAtlantic project, uh, which was called Atlas, actually uh, was very instrumental at um, setting up the, the Aspire initiative because uh, the first Proto Aspire meeting happened in the framework of, of one of the um, Atlas meetings. So it, it's, a, it's a vehicle to bring people together. Um, besides that, large research projects are um, a chance to launch research expeditions. Uh, and most of them will include some form of bathymetry collection um, or will give a platform which we then can um, use for at least some opportunistic uh, bathymetry data connect collection along transit lines or something. Um, and scientists tend to go to uh, places that not many other people tend to go to. So in terms of filling the, the boxes on the Atlantic map, um, we, we tend to go to places that are not visited very often and, and therefore it, there is more chance to fill, fill the boxes that otherwise, otherwise might stay empty. Anybody else? Go ahead. I'm looking for a raised hand button, but I can't find it. I'm just speak. <laughs> Pretend um, we're in the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more with, with Verla. I think these um, international collaboration is, is absolutely key and it presents an opportunity to network. And, and again, you know, through Mission Atlantic, we've made contact with uh, folks uh, who are interested in habitat mapping in uh, you know in Brazil and through that uh, to to Argentina and then um, through the One Ocean Hub equally from from South Africa making contacts in Uruguay and it's been it's it's making those networks and those networks are so so important to to what we're trying to do here because it 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 requires a, a huge level of coordination and collaboration um, and also relationships and trust between partners and. Um, and that takes time to build up, I think. And so these these international projects and, and, and you know, having funding to work together on a common project and common goals, you know, builds those relationships and builds that trust. And I think it's, um, yeah, imperative going forward that we continue with these with these large international projects. Yeah, and I'll add from my perspective uh, with my Seabed 2030 hat on that these are the kinds of activities that really lay the foundation for what we're trying to do. We're trying to build on efforts at local regional scales to really help us achieve our global goals. 
And it's the good work of all people, all people working in this space that we can put together where the 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 sum is bigger than the whole, you know, everything together is much a, a much better answer and a much more complete uh, solution, I guess. Um, any other comments on this question? Yes, Vicky. Uh, I, I, I could say that in our projects, we deal uh, mostly with marine geology and geophysics in an integrated way. So it will be very important to be partners of the Aspire for the mapping in the South Atlantic. Uh, whether for purpose of scientific knowledge, uh, associated maybe with the genesis and evolution of the South Atlantic in its various aspects, uh, but also applied to exploration uh, of living resources, minerals. Uh, we have a number of projects now in Brazil uh, where we are uh, exploring uh, the high seas. Uh, so therefore, seafloor mapping, we think is the basis for all our hydrographic, oceanographic, geological or geophysical projects. And uh, of course, uh, the South Atlantic is very wide. Uh, we have uh, many lakes to fill. So I think this effort to make partnership uh, with the uh, South, uh, South American countries and also with the uh, Africa countries uh, is fundamental for this. Absolutely. All right, so maybe we'll move on to another question. Um, what are the challenges in developing large international research projects um, and their seabed mapping components? And also maybe think about what are the big challenges that we might expect for mapping in the South Atlantic? It's a bit of an extension of what we were just talking about. I can start again. <laughs> and actually, I'm going to pick up on something that Carrie mentioned already. Um, she she dropped the word funding, and I, I think that's actually um, to go and map. I mean, the Atlantic Ocean is is a vast place. So we've heard the, the the metrics of how much is mapped only, and how much still has to be mapped. And these are big expeditions, um, big operations. Um, so a, a good funding model is is really necessary to, to get the ships out there and to do the mapping. And in that sense, um, I would advocate for not just a, a good funding model, but a coordinated funding model that goes across the Atlantic that actually makes the sides of the Atlantic talk to each other. Because again, referring to previous constructs um, where the EU has a number of funding programs, but then can't fund people in Canada, for example. Now, thanks to some of the funding models in Horizon 2020, we can actually um, fund some of our Brazilian or South African partners, but um, it would be ideal if both sides and North and South would come together and get a construct that, because trying to line up programs from, the states, for example, and then combine it with a ship that's being sent out from Europe and make sure that everybody gets there at the same time. It, it's so much logistics, so much headache, and all that time and effort could be used to actually do the mapping or do the science rather than doing the logistics. Yes, I, I agree totally with this. Uh, uh, see, uh, here in Brazil, we, we have the experience of uh, participating of very large expeditions in the South Atlantic, uh, working together with uh, American and European agencies and universities. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, here in the Southern Oceans, uh, we don't have a, a very wide infrastructure. Uh, I mean, uh, we don't have dedicated research vessels uh, for uh, doing this mapping. Uh, at least in Brazil, 
uh, in the Brazilian continental margin, I would say we have a very, very good infrastructure. Uh, but to go to the high seas, uh, for sure, uh, we will need to make partners with you uh, from the North Atlantic mainly, uh, because we will need to share uh, ship time in this research vessel. Uh, but of course, we have a plenty experience uh, to work in this large expedition, as I said, in the South Atlantic. So I think it will be very productive for everyone. Gary? Yeah, I think that that access to ships and resources is a is a big, uh, a slightly bigger challenge in the South Atlantic than it is in the North Atlantic. And the mapping work we've been involved with in the South Atlantic has used um, European vessels coming down from the North Atlantic. And it just seems that's, you know, not, not the best way of doing things. And so I think increasing access to vessels is really important but but particularly for south atlantic nations yeah so so you know those nations bordering the south atlantic uh, need access to those vessels and i think that's perhaps where philanthropy um can come in and play a role but particularly under the ocean decades coming up um you know the likes of schmidt ocean institute rev ocean um and and, and others um are perhaps able to provide access to the kinds of equipment and resources needed to to do this kind of work in deep water at least um to those nations who perhaps have less access to uh, that sort of uh, technical capability so it's about um you know technology transfer building capacity and and, and provision of access widening access so one thing that i'll add from my perspective um is you know as research vessels and exploration vessels are out there um, doing their work, while it's certainly arguably better um, to be collecting data in a survey pattern, a dedicated survey to really get a lot of data at once. Um, in the US, we've had huge success with opportunistic data collected during transits. Um, and as someone who catches that data and works with it and synthesizes it into product, I just wanted to remind everyone that even if you don't have a sonar specialist on board who'll be processing the data and monitoring the system really closely, it's definitely worth turning the sensor on and collecting data if the system will run, because someone like myself or my group or lots of other people can catch that data and work with it. Um, it's such a unique opportunity, given the vastness of the ocean and the sparseness of data that exists. Um, we should really be aspiring to collect as much data as possible and really promoting that. Opportunistic isn't the best, but it does give us a huge amount of data coverage um, that when we piece it all together actually creates very coherent maps of the seafloor. So not necessarily a prefer preferred option, but uh, an important one. Um, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna just gonna really advocate that by giving you an example. So we've been using opportunistic collected data from the South Atlantic from the high seas in our predictive modeling work. And, and it's been invaluable. So it's little patches of information, but it's still better than no information. So, um, so really, really just strongly support opportunistic data collection whenever possible. Um, there's a question in the chat that relates to a question I was going to ask. Uh, so I'll see if I can um, summarize it a little bit, which is, uh, is there, uh, a consistent logical sequence from data acquisition to information interpretation and modeling, such as integrated ecological assessment models and habitat mapping. mapping. Um, this involves technological development, but also development of new data treatment and processing techniques. Um, so I guess, uh, I guess the first answer is mapping first uh, tends to be what's done and to follow up with what we were just talking about, you know, making sure that any new mapping effort or any new, uh, you know, seafloor work that we're doing that involves maps, uh, that you do some research first to see if data exist, right? And so the IHO Data Center for Digital Bathymetry is a good place to start. And um, Jen will be telling us more about that later. But really starting to work together as a community, which we're seeing more and more 
um, particularly with the, the motivation, I think, of CBED 2030, but also the community was really moving toward this anyway. The, the timeliness of all this, I think, uh, is very natural, um, where we're exchanging information about collecting data um, in advance or you know, being a little bit more open with data holdings before they're fully released and processed. Um, but that was a little bit of a response to this question. Do any uh, of you want to try to address this question, particularly, I guess, with respect to benthic habitat mapping, et cetera? Go for it. Um, I, I, uh, I totally agree with um, uh, Luis Conti um, that, uh, yes, the, the, the first sequence is, is um, very important and getting more and more established. Um, but uh, trying to get more out of the data through the new technological developments and the new data um, treatment techniques. So that's also why, for example, in the I Atlantic project within our mapping work package, <laughs> so it's included, we have this technological development compartment with machine learning, with um, development of new types of cameras, sampling systems, uh, new modeling approaches, um, new data analysis approaches, um, because yeah, <laughs> We, we have so little data about the ocean, we have to squeeze everything out of it that we can. Wow. Anybody else? Go ahead. Well, just following on from that, I think, um, as, as Verla well knows, <laughs> you know, one of the one of the difficult things uh, in once you've collected, particularly the, the biological side of things. So the, the seafloor mapping side of things is, is the first stage of mapping, uh, absolutely. Um, and then of course you need to put the information on top of that so you get the information on the biology but but the difficulty with the biology data is it's just so horribly time consuming to process i mean and it, it is the the bottleneck you know we see Verla nodding it is the bottleneck in everything that we do is how long it takes to process that data and there's huge huge archives of data that are sitting unprocessed because we just don't have the capacity to get to them. But techniques like artificial intelligence, and again, in Mission Atlantic, and I think I Atlantic the same, um, you know, looking at applying artificial intelligence to image processing to speed up the uh, rate at which we can pull biological quantitative information from image data so that it can then be used in habitat suitability models and species distribution models, which of course brings the uh, BATHI data back in to predict where species and habitats will be found. And that's how we map the biology. So these new techniques and approaches are, are absolutely critical to speeding up um, the, the mapping of the oceans. And I'm talking very much about the biological mapping, mapping in all its forms. Um, because I don't think the problem anymore is that we can't collect the data. On the biological side, we can collect the data. We, we simply cannot process it at, at the rate at which it's collected at the moment. Um, so that's a massive nut to crack that I know quite a few people are working on, including ourselves uh, in Mission Atlantic. Okay, I'm going to pivot a little bit as we're starting to get a little bit tight on time. Uh, so the next question I'm going to ask David to answer first, uh, but how has international collaboration on seabed mapping impacted your career development? Um, how are you doing, Vicky? Thanks for that. <clears throat> sure. I would say there would be a positive correlation between my career and seabed mapping. Um, I'm, as I said earlier, I'm here to speak for early career scientists. I'm in. I'm a marine science. I'm a marine scientist for ten years. I don't know if that exactly makes me an early career marine scientist or not. But um, as I said a while ago, not so long ago, I was snorkeling around uh, the south coast of Ireland, making habitat maps and counting sea urchins, and that led to a paper which was published and brought me into the Marine Institute. And from there again, I'm starting to look at the interaction between different species and the benthic habitats, and produce studies on commercial um, species of fish like herring and, and nephrops. And the underlying data, the, one of the most important underlying data sets within all this was, was multi-beam data. And how you could delineate um, uh, backscatter, and how you could delineate uh, seabed classification bathymetry, and how that linked to species and environments and habitats. Totally fascinating. And somewhere along the way, I realized that we, Ireland had a national seabed mapping program, which I had to admit I didn't know when I joined the Marine Institute uh, that it was as advanced as it was. Um, I was able to move into that. Um, 
and as a career progression, you know, you get to learn things like hydrographic surveys, and this is another bow in someone's career or someone's um, CV. And from there, all of a sudden, I'm on this international transit. I'm going across the Atlantic. Um, so having the having Infomar, having this large uh, collaboration in Ireland early on, and Ireland seabed mapping dates back to you know 20, 30 years, but to the Geological Survey, the Irish National Seabed Survey. Um, and that led on to Infomar. These themselves are collaborations. They're working on government um, different government agencies within Ireland. I mean, that's expanded to the Atlantic um, with the Galway Statement. It's signed here in the Marine Institute. Uh, Infomar are, are, are central to that from a European point of view, but obviously also there's other European partners. But, you know, um, it, it was a big thing for us in, in Infomar. And then we're dealing with um, at NOAA more. We're talking to the Canadian Hydrographic Service. We're running international transects. So this huge door of opportunity opens for someone who's you know has a marine biology and a hydrographic surveying background. So if you can piggyback along that and take your opportunities as they come along, um, and there's there's benefits to it. So yeah, my career has progressed along from there. And then you know we have to be able to in, be in those positions to pivot to take these challenges to understand the opportunities when they, when you when they come, and that led on to Sea Rover, which was um, a quite a large scale um, collaborative project um, in Ireland where we we mapped the abundance and distribution of um, sensitive habitats. And but that was a collaboration between um, the Irish government, lots of government departments here in Ireland. Plymouth University. I worked with Kerry. She was on a number of the surveys. Um, we had we had lots of project partners, and it would be remiss of me to try and remember to say them all. But this survey came about because of this the, these these partnerships that have been developed over time. And as long as you can, as I said, be in that position to to pivot to to take your opportunities as they come. Um, you never know where it's going to bring you, and you never know what you're going to get out of it. So we're sitting now on this massive uh, network. Um, of uh, political people and this abundance and distribution of sensitive habitats, which has led again now to maybe looking into the Atlantic. How are we going to do that further into the Atlantic? So very positively, in a very short answer. <clears throat> I was going to say when I was a graduate student, I was uh, very isolated in a lab with mostly just my advisor working on multi-beam data and the world is very different now, which is wonderful to see. Um, in our last couple minutes, does anybody else have anything to add about capacity development and maybe opportunities within uh, your programs to bring early career people into the mix? I know in the Jebco community, there's a training program that has been very successful at engaging different parts of the world, um, but maybe um, some of you have some insight or some thoughts on this. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead first. Well, I was just going to say on the on the um, on the capacity building side of things and training side of things. Um, I think lots of the large European projects, Atlantic Mission Atlantic, all, all have a sort of early career, a huge early career presence in there, um, and training programs for early career scientists, um, which is which is really really great. Um, but I think there's an issue around um, training early career people, particularly from nations who have not traditionally been able to engage in deep sea science or, or, or mapping particularly for, for whatever reason. Um, and one of the things I found with working with our partners in, in South Africa and Namibia is, is that, you know, there, there, are, there are, you know, there are people who, who can do these things, but there just simply aren't enough of them. And, and so there's, there's capacity that needs to be built in terms of people capacity to really engage in these, in these big programs because um, it's always the same few people and they're massively overworked <laughs> um, because they're, they're engaging in all these big programs. And so there's a definite people capacity building that, that, that would be great to have happen uh, and to support the sort of development of early career scientists, particularly from these nations have got, you know, all, all of the burden is falling onto the same people's shoulders. Uh, so that needs to kind of broaden to, to help engagement. Yeah, so I, I could say that uh, since uh, I, I started to work uh, with oceanography by the end of the 80s, uh, so far almost 40 years, uh, we have also 
very a very important uh, collaboration with uh, uh, foreign universities in Brazil. Uh, I would say that uh, this collaboration was part of my background. Uh, we 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 made a, a very big project for mapping the whole Brazilian continental margin during the 70s, the 80s, almost the 90s, uh, where we have a partnership with the Lamont, Doherty Earth Laboratory, Scripps Institution, uh, Woods Hole, Fremer, and so on. So uh, for us here in the PGGM now, uh, as I said, we have uh, almost 27 institutions. Uh, most of them are universities. So our tradition is to uh, uh, make partners with other countries uh, in order to give the opportunity to our students, undergraduates or graduate students, uh, to have also this background. So I think uh, partnership, uh, collaborations, uh, and uh, you know, PGGM works, uh, deals with marine geology and geophysics. So uh, all the time we, we, we do mapping, uh, mapping the, the seafloor, mapping the seabed is fundamental for any uh, of our projects. So we, we, we very open to this. And also we invited uh, students from Europe, uh, US, Africa. We have a uh, plenty number of uh, African students uh, now uh, uh, participating in our graduate programs. Great, uh, thank you for that. I am going to uh, end the panel now because we're a little bit tight on time, but thank you all for your contributions. There are a few questions in the Q&A that um, the panelists can probably try to answer uh, in typed form uh, after we uh, aren't, aren't speaking live. Um, but thank you again, and I hope everyone uh, found this useful. I'm gonna pass it back to Terry, I think, who will introduce the final um, phase of this uh, event. Thanks. Well, thanks. Thanks, Vicki, for leading a, a pretty rich discussion. Um, I think we could have gone on for, for much longer, but uh, time being what it is. Uh, any con any questions that are in the, in the uh, Q&A box that didn't get answered, uh, we can see about getting those answered uh, uh, through correspondence uh, following the event. Uh, I'd like to now go into our closing remarks. Um, uh, I'd, I'd like to invite first uh, Jennifer Jenks. Um, she leads NOAA's, NOAA's National Center for Environmental Information and Ocean Coastal Mapping Team and serves as the director of the IHO Data Center for Digital Bathymetry, which is hosted by NCEI. Um, so Jen, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Terry. Take a second here and share my screen. So I'll look to one of you to, I'll look to Terry. Can you give me a thumbs up that you can see my screen? Screen, but it's not in presentation mode yet. Okay, sounds good. Let's see. There we go. I'm gonna turn my video off while I do this because I, I'm not always a fan of not being able to, to see myself as I present. Makes me a little self-conscious. Okay, so here we go. Okay. So again, thank you, Terry, for this opportunity to speak to everyone today. Um, I'm getting over a cold, so I'm a little, a little funny sounding. So please bear with me here. So as we begin to close out today's side event, I'd like to spend a few minutes discussing what many of us believe is a key piece, absolutely necessary if we want to achieve our mapping and exploration goals, and that is data sharing. As Terry said, my name is Jennifer Jenks, and as director of the IHO Data Center for Digital Bathymetry, I am part of a team that strives to make bathymetric data as accessible and discoverable as possible. As we've seen in earlier presentations today and heard discussed during the panel, 
Mapping the Atlantic is obviously no small challenge. The gaps in data coverage are immense and conversations have been taking place for years over just how exactly to strategize mapping them. There are many criteria that can be considered when deciding how to map the prioritization of a region, but most agree that data scarcity is a key driver. We know that mapping is expensive and time consuming and no one wants to use their limited resources to map an area where data already exists. And yet almost every time this map is shown or one similar to this, we learn about data sitting on a shelf someplace. Valuable data that could contribute, that could be one of these key pieces of the puzzle that moves us towards our common goals. But the community can't hold off prioritizing and mapping while we hope for these data to make an appearance, we must move forward. And as Casey discussed earlier, NOAA Ocean Exploration used the North Atlantic study from a few years ago as motivation to map a defined high priority area south of Bermuda, the red square there. This was a collaborative effort from start to finish, from selecting the area, to coordinating the mapping effort, to sharing that data. Oh no, that's not what you want. Let's see, show anyway, does that do it? Ha ha. Hold on guys, technical difficulties. Thank you all for your patience. Okay. So data that can now be discovered and accessed by the global community. So here we're looking at the DCDB viewer. So these are survey track lines in green that indicate the location of multi-beam bathymetric data holdings that are archived here at the DCDB and are available for direct download and access. By selecting, selecting that NOAA Ocean Exploration Survey, basic information can be gleaned from the metadata in the viewer here and then by clicking the link to data button, the user can go and directly download the data. The IHO DCDB, which is hosted by NOAA, was established 30 years ago to ensure that a public international repository existed, which would accept and manage, archive and share freely and without restrictions, contributed bathymetric data. These data are submitted to the DCDB typically are not assessed and reside in our archive as is. It remains up to the users to determine their value and utility for their own purpose. In this way, the DCDB data holdings serve as a world reference for raw bathymetric data, which can be used as the basis for refined and processed products such as the JEPCO Seabed 2030 bathymetric grids. Data collected from opportunistic surveys, which Vicki stressed the importance of a little while ago, are a key data contributor to the repository. Here we see the track lines of bathymetry data collected from the US academic research fleet, both from the research areas and also while in transit. The commitment from Fugro to collect and contribute data during their transits, transits has been truly inspirational. Since 2015, data from 80 transit surveys have been added to the DCDB database. And over the last few years, the IHO Crowdsource Bathymetry Initiative has been encouraging the collection and contribution of depth measurements from vessels using their standard navigation instrumentation while engaged in their routine maritime operations. These contributions continue to grow as we work to expand the number of participants. All of this is to say that contributions from opportunistic surveys really do matter. You, as Vicki also stressed, you don't need to have dedicated mapping staff on board. There is a community waiting to catch and process and correct these data. 
And at the DCDB, we're happy to archive these data, either raw or processed, and make them available to the community. What we need is for you to just turn your sonar on. Now, along with displaying the global coverage of the DCDB's bathymetric data holdings, the viewer also provides discovery of data archived at other repositories by ingesting their web services. Here, we're looking at the track lines in red of data held by EMON Nets. By clicking on any of these track lines, a user can again learn basic information about that data set and then be redirected to EMONnet for direct access of the data. For those of you that are hopefully now super excited at the prospect of contributing data, there are a few avenues to take. The simplest, most straightforward way is this JEPCO web form, which was created with the intent to have a single location to point all potential data contributors to. The JEPCO data contribution form requests very general information about the data provider and data set. And once submitted, we'll notify JEPCO, CBET 2030, and IHO DCDB data managers of the potential new availability of data. Also included is a direct question asking if in addition to making your data available to the JEPCO project, would you also be willing to have that data archived at the DCDB? Understanding that organizing data can be cumbersome, the DCDB website also provides information and resources to assist you in the packaging and submission of data. We offer CruisePack, which is a standalone data packager designed to simplify the process through the use of a simple UI with pull-down menus. And the software generates your metadata records and creates straightforward and consistent data packages. The other resource we provide is us. We are here to help, to answer your questions, to help you in documenting your data, to do whatever we can to get your valuable data archived and made available to the public. Mapping the Atlantic will take coordination and collaboration. We all know that. And the DCDB is just one of many key players in this endeavor, but it is valuable, if, but it's only valuable if the community contributes data to it. So please consider this an invitation to use the services of the DCDB by contributing your data or web services, by using our viewer to access data and for learning where the data gaps exist. We're here to support all of these great mapping efforts in any way we can. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, thank you, Jen, uh, for, that, for that great presentation, the importance of the data, knowing where the data is before we go out and do, do new mapping and, and, and really the importance that we're gonna have to work together to get, get, gain access to all the data that is currently available and so we have a better understanding of what needs to be done. And I also like the message that we continue to have, which is turn on the bathymetry, turn on the multi-beam, gather the data. There are those that can catch the data and process it later, even if there is a little bit of a backlog. So moving on, uh, I'm watching the time. We're probably going to go over just a couple of minutes. I'm hoping that's okay, but I would like to um, invite our, our, our last closing speaker to, to the floor, Nuno Lorenzo. Um, he's on the board of directors for the Atlant Atlantic Collab in Portugal. And so Nuno, I will give the floor to you. Nuno, you are on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Now, I was just thanking Terry for, for the invitation to be here and do these <laughs> remarks and saying good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, I think uh, this was a, a fantastic uh, um, session. And uh, we all know, as uh, we are here participating, the importance of having sound seabed mapping and ocean exploration data, Casey style, as she presented it for marine sciences, for many applications in marine sciences, and for any actions concerning preservation, conservation, exploration, exploitation, marine spatial planning. So this is foundational data where we build upon our, our work. So this, this session came in, in a, a timely manner. It's, it's really important we had this, this session uh, as to be able to evaluate the results uh, or assess the, the, the results of the collaborative efforts that have been going on in the past. 
and looking forward to see uh, which steps should be given now to stretch this, this uh, early uh, uh, collaboration between east and west on the north to east, west, north, south, to stretch it to the old Atlantic and to achieve hopefully a, 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 an old Atlantic patriotic map. So we, we, one thing that pops up from the conversations from what you, you guys said is that we have a much more cooperative environment. Um, and this allowed to, to have uh, stringent results uh, with regard to, to, to the initiatives that were going on during the past decade. Uh, I'll summarize some points. We gathered significant amounts of data from opportunistic and educated surveys. Everybody spoke about this. We had industry became more engaged in, in, in producing data to, to research. Uh, Jen just referred about the, the crowdsource bathymetry, uh, which was added to data collection schemes. Um, we improved definitely data sharing mechanisms and data management infrastructures, especially through DCDB, ModNet, or other data centers. Um, so um, I think more data became more available and open data policies are doing their thing to, to allow for that. And pro probably very important, uh, very, uh, very important and not uh, totally quantifiable, we have raised awareness of the importance of seabed mapping to policymakers, which are the ones who make decisions and the civil society at large. It should be referred especially uh, the tremendous boost brought up by the Seabed 2030 project from JEPCO and Nippon Foundation. That was a breakthrough and gave even more momentum to this, to this challenge. Um, but we also have seen during the session that uh, uh, we still have tremendous gaps of, of knowledge and tremendous gaps of coverage in, in our Atlantic uh, future map less in the north, uh, more, more, uh, more stringent on the south. And um, so we simply have many very large data holes in our Atlantic map that we need to, to fill in. This is particularly important when we consider marine protected areas or, or um, EPSAs uh, in the high seas or uh, VME occurrences, so uh, vulnerable marine ecosystems occurrences, notably in areas impacted by trawling within RFMOs, so regional fisheries management areas. We are still lacking systematic coverage and detailed uh, knowledge on most of these uh, areas. So in short, we still have a tremendous amount of work to do. I was hearing people, uh, and I want to stress and highlight some of the key points that they, 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 uh, they announced, and I'll put some, some, a couple of my own, if you don't mind. So actions to, to keep taking or undertake uh, in this new approach for the old Atlantic. Uh, and this was referred to by Casey. We need to improve articulation mechanisms across ongoing scientific projects. Uh, this would enable us to have, you know, uh, a, more, a more focused um, uh, effort and a, a better definition of mapping priorities. Um, at the same time, we still struggle with the same point. Research fleets are flag, uh, are not uh, international, so they, they are bound to the interests of each nation. But we need to improve articulation mechanisms across research fleets. Uh, for instance, this could be done, uh, and we did something alike, if you recall, Jen, uh, an old Atlantic collaborative platform where you could uh, depict on polygons uh, which missions are going to be undertaken who's taking them, who are the PIs to ease up communication between actors. What we don't want is like we had in Lucky Strike in Mid-Atlantic Reach Axis in the 90s, where you had about three or four systematic surveys over the same areas. This is simply not efficient. Uh, although a lot is being done in terms of cooperation mechanisms between North and South, uh, we need to improve the proximity of research communities. Marcel will talk about this and technical communities the operational ones, the guys that are in ships also. Um, we know that the, the, the you know, research infrastructure and capacity across the Atlantic is asymmetrical. Uh, and so we need to have to envisage ways to, to reinforce capacity building, access to technologies for less favored countries and training approach uh, uh, to bring research communities and technical, uh, technical communities closer. Some suggestions, we could try to set up uh, mobility programs for marine technicians and surveyors, allowing for on-job training in foreign vessels um, and promote links between North and South mapping programs. And this could be done uh, 
through, for instance, the creation simulator what we had on the north through Aora, a South Atlantic Seabed Mapping International Working Group that would liaise with Aspire or with the, the, the North Atlantic Group and create connectivity and awareness of actions and strategies and good practices and so on and so forth. Um, fourthly, continue to improve data collection. Uh, the, the Please leave it on or put your sonars on, like Jen said. Uh, uh, although unattended data can be a problem, having uh, unattended data with modern systems is much better than having no data at all. And we need to keep engaging with private marine sectors, the operators, to, to get more data, especially opportunistic while transiting. We need also to keep track of other sources of data, for instance, military that becomes unclassified, uh, international seabed authority exploration blogs. Normally, there are standard surveys doing on those blogs. Uh, for, for exploration purposes, for mining exploration purposes, and above all, legal continental shelf data as they become declassified or released for open access. For instance, Portugal, when, when we'll have recommendations from the, the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, we'll have a significant covered area that will be, be made available to, to, to all the data centers covering Madeira archipelagos, Azores archipelagos, and lots of the West Iberia margin. So before I go, just to, as a final remark, I would like to address a bit the future. Uh, although money is an issue and uh, funding is an issue, uh, I think we should be optimistic about the, the, the future and the, to achieve a more complete picture of the Atlantic seabed. I think we are collaborating more with better mechanisms. We are sharing more data and data management structure, and we have more capable technologies. This also goes for ocean exploration. You can envisage that we are getting new submarine observatories on Europe through EMSO, uh, complementing the ones on US, Canada, China, Norway, etc. We are having a new generation of submarine cables which can be instrumented for science and, and able to retrieve some uh, essential ocean variables on the deep sea. We are, we are assisting in massification of relatively low cost sensors like Argos floats and biogeochemical Argos floats and low cost AUVs, which can also map the, the seafloor and shallow waters. We are entering in the, in the new space ever, so we'll have new satellites, which will ease up IoT communications, data upload, so we'll have much more quantities of data made available in real time. And we'll have better robotics, better autonomy, com more compact sensors, which will enable uh, approaches which are not science fiction anymore about fleets of unmanned surface vehicles articulated with, with research fleets, with research vessels doing mapping on the seafloor. We are not there yet, but we are getting there. So to, to wrap up and to end, uh, all in all, it's up to us, the Atlantic mapping and research community to keep the drive, the collaboration, the momentum going, keep pressing decision making for, for, for clever, clever uh, choices to complete in the best way possible the seabed mapping of the Atlantic, at least in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nuno, for those uh, excellent closing remarks. I think it uh, lays out the challenges, the actions, and the opportunities before us. But I think uh, most of all, it lays out the, uh, the need for us to continue the conversation. Um, this event, uh, as, as wonderful it is, um, will not be effective if we don't continue the conversation and look to move forward as an all Atlantic community in these endeavors, both in mapping and in exploration. So I lay that challenge out before us as well. And perhaps we can we can think about over the, the in the future of maybe potentially holding a workshop, finding a way in which we could conduct a workshop to bring partners in and, and continue this conversation and, and define some actions we can take. I wanna thank all the uh, speakers today uh, for, for their and the panelists for, for taking their time to present and to discuss uh, this important, important uh, information. I wanna thank Vicki for uh, for uh, coordinating the, uh, the the panel discussion, uh, I want to thank Monica for uh, coordinating the overall um, uh, event uh, and and helping us get all hooked up here on Zoom. Um, and I want to thank all of you for taking time uh, out of your schedules to join us. Uh, sorry we went a little bit over, but hopefully it was well worth your time. And I want to say thank you very much. And enjoy okay, the thank you the thank you everyone we hope to see you to see you soon
here in the South Atlantic for many expeditions. Count me in, Marcel. Stay brave. That sounds good. I'm going to. <laughs>